our international ground round. Today's special topic regarding the frontal sinus with a master and the sinus surgery for frontal sinusotomy. We're talking about PJ Wormel from Adelaide University, uh, Australia. Uh, I think that he do not need any introduction. Amazing works, a few uh, books published, tons of uh, articles. Uh, because of the time difference, uh, he couldn't be able to assist, so he just sent me the presentation, and I'm about to share it with you. I remind everyone, in case that you want to uh, ask any information, he will be able to uh, type and reply to your questions directly, because we are about to proceed presenting your his email directly. So uh, if you are ready, we are about to proceed. Thank you for this opportunity to present my talk today, Unlocking the Frontal Sinus. My disclosures are that I received royalty from Tonic and Integra. I'm a consultant for Neil Med and Urent, and I'm stock holding in Cardiff Hill. The format of my talk is going to be discussing the frontal cell classification, going over the building block concept, discussing access the frontal sinus and then presenting some examples. Anteriorly based cells are associated with the frontal process uh, of the maxilla. These cells have an intimate relation with the frontal process and start with the agonase cell, which is the first cell encountered as we enter the frontal recess through the axilla of the middle terminus. Any cell that sits above the agonase cell is called the superagonal cell. The cell is associated with the frontal ostium, but does not go through the frontal ostium into the frontal sinus. Any cell that goes through the frontal sinus is called a superagonal frontal cell. All of these cells tend to push the drainage pathway posteriorly. If we look at posteriorly based cells, these cells are associated with the skull base. The ethmodalis is a common cell found in most patients, does not touch the skull base typically. On rare occasions, it can progress all the way up to the skull base. Cells that sit above the ethmodalis and don't go through the frontal ostium are called superbullar cells. Superbullar cells that actually go through the frontal ostium are called superbullar frontal cells. All of these cells push the drainage pathway anteriorly. We have another posteriorly based cell, a superorbital ethmoid cell, which is associated with the anterior artery. This cell tends to migrate over the orbit in patients who have extensive pneumatization of their cells. One final cell is an anteriorly based cell associated with the frontal sinus septum. This cell is called the frontal septal cell. This cell tends to push the pathway laterally. So we have a very simple classification, which is easy to remember. Agonazi, supraga, Superagafrontal or anterior cells, bulla ethmodalis, superbullar cell, superbullar frontal cell, all posteriorly based cells. Two other cells, superorbital ethmoid and the frontal septal cell. We utilize this classification when we plan our surgery in the frontal recess. Let me start when faced with a complex CV scan, such as this scan on the left hand side which has significant complexity in the cell arrangement and therefore some challenges with the dissection. What do we do when we face with a patient like this, which has multiple cells and has a very complex arrangement of cells and very difficult to understand anatomy? We consider it a bit like climbing Mount Everest, an impossible task. If we think about Mount Everest, 
there are many different pathways to the top. And what we need to do is choose the easiest path, which is reliable and safe. We don't want to be caught on the northeast face with a difficult dissection to do. We want to be comfortable, easygoing, and finding a pathway which does not result in significant tension for the surgeon and risk and danger for the patient. So what is the building block concept? The building block concept is utilizing software to first scroll through the images to get an understanding of what the general anatomy looks like on that frontal sinus on the left-hand side. We then highlight the building block icon and then draw a building block on each of the cells that we've identified. The agonizing cell has a building block place for it. And then we identify the superpolar front of the cell and we place a building block on that cell. Utilizing the corners, we can create the best fit possible for that building block on that particular cell. We then proceed along the skull base to the superpolar cell, identify that cell, and name that cell according to. Our classification. The next cell is the bullet of Davis. And then once we've placed the building block for the bullet and named it, we can then proceed to the frontal recess, to the frontal septal cell. And we can see that frontal septal cell again affecting that drainage pathway of that frontal sinus. We then name that cell. We now have a three-dimensional concept of the cells of that frontal recess. The very next important step is identifying the frontal sinus drainage pathway. We draw that pathway in on the parasagittal scan, and then using the axial slider on the axial scan, we look to identify exactly where that drainage pathway goes in relation to the cells that we've drawn on that building block. It's vitally important that we understand the relationship between the frontal sinus drainage pathway and each of these cells, because this will determine our surgical plan. So while it's important to identify the cell structures, it's vitally important to identify the drainage pathway, because we don't want to put an instrument through the roof of the cell. We want to slide an instrument up the drainage pathway and fracture that cell away. If you place an instrument through the roof of the cell, you will often create a risk of either entering the orbit or intracranial cavity and creating a CSF leak. So first things that we need to do is identify the agonizing cell. And we do this straightforwardly on the CT scan, and then we do it on the patient via the axillary flap. If we look at the CT scan, we can see that the agonizing cell is the first cell that is visualized as we identify the middle terminate and its association with the middle terminate. We can find that exact cell by doing the auxiliary flap on the patient. We create an incision, we raise the flap up, we tuck the flap between the middle terminate and the septum. We take a hijack off the punch and remove the anterior wall of the agonizing cell. And that allows us to visualize the roof of the agonizing cell and identify it accurately on the patient. So now we have the cell identified on the scan and the cell identified on the patient. So our next step is to look at the cell that sits directly adjacent to that agonizing cell. And in this patient, it is superagrofrontal cell. We can look at the superagrofrontal cell in all three planes and we can then identify it on our patient. Here we can see the remnants of the agonizing cell just being removed the roof and we're visualizing straight into the superagrofrontal cell. Next step is to identify the frontal sinus drainage pathway because to remove the superagrofrontal cell we need to know where the frontal sinus drainage pathway is 
to be able to slide our instrument up that pathway, which then allows us to fracture away the superagofrontal cell and expose the front osteo. So looking on the CT scan, we identify the frontal sinus drainage pathway and draw it in. We can see this particular patient has two frontal sinuses and the medial one drains anteriorly immediately. And we can view that by utilizing the slider on the axial scan. So our next surgical steps that we're going to do is identify the supraagofrontal cell and that anterior medial drainage pathway. So looking at our patient, we can see the anterior medial drainage pathway coming into view. We can then slide our instrument up that anterior medial drainage pathway and start to identify the pathway and its relationship to the supraagofrontal cell. Sliding the instrument up the drainage pathway allows us to fracture laterally the wall of that supraagofrontal cell and starts to bring us into view of the frontal recess superiorly and eventually the frontal sinus osteo. Taking away the medial wall of that supraagofrontal cell will then expose the suprapulofrontal cell, which, uh, which anterior to that suprapulofrontal cell, we will find the uh, frontal osteum. So identifying how that frontal osteum relates to the suprapulofrontal frontal cell, we can see that the lamina of the suprapulofrontal frontal cell is coming anteriorly, and we need to fracture that away posteriorly to expose that frontal osteum. So here we are visualizing that frontal osteum anteriorly and posteriorly the wall of the suprapulofrontal frontal cell. So fracturing that posterior wall of the superpolar frontal cell allows us to identify the skull base and the anterior artery, removing that posterior wall of that superpolar frontal cell, exposing the skull base, gives us a little bit more room to now, when we proceed anteriorly, to visualize the anterior wall of the superpolar frontal cell and remove that to then visualize the frontal osteo, this double frontal osteo that the patient has. So preserving the mucosa, taking the bone out only while leaving the mucosa undisturbed uh, allows for even small frontal sinus osteo to heat up very nicely in the post operative period because they haven't been denuded of the mucosa. Double frontal osteo is uncommon, and one might say that it may even well be a um, frontal septal cell immediately with the frontal sinus laterally. However, the nomenclature is unimportant as long as we fully understood the anatomy of how these two cells relate to each other and how the frontal sinus drainage pathway relates to both the superbullet frontal as well as the superbullet frontal cell. We create these 3D images. Well, we have the software, which is now um, driven by Striker, which allows us to draw on the actual CD scan. And the way the software works is once we've identified all the cells that we want to look at, we can then use the building blocks to highlight a particular cell. Then Using the corners of the cell, we can choose which scan is best to manipulate those corners before we name that cell and proceed to the next cell. And so this process of identifying each cell individually and then moving on to putting the building block in place is the process that we really need to follow to get that really unique understanding of that anatomy of the frontal recess. Identifying the drainage pathway again is important and allows us to plan our surgery. We want to plan so that each cell is entered and we know exactly which cell we're in, both on the CT scan on the patient, what sequence we're going to enter those cells, and where to look for the frontal drainage pathway. <coughs> 
So what are the benefits of the Excel Reflect? Reflect. What happens is that you need to use angled telescopes and you need to use angled instruments to have to reach the frontal recess. What the uh, auxiliary flat does is raises the axilla of the uh, middle turbinate and allows you to use mostly straight endoscopes initially and less angled uh, endoscopes as we approach the frontal ostium because the distance is much smaller to the frontal ostium than if we had gone underneath the normal axilla. The axillary flap also allows us to identify the most important and first cell of our section, which is the agonizing cell. So here we can see that straight endoscope, a minimally angled instrument is required, but as you increase the angulation of your endoscope, so you need to increase the angulation of the instrument. And when you're using very angled telescopes and instruments, the temptation is often to put the instrument above the telescope. But in these situations, what happens is you're looking at the back of the endoscope and back of the instrument so that you don't actually see where the tip's working and this can increase the risk uh, in the infection. So let's put this into practice. Here we have a 25 year old patient with life and pain and pressure. Improved on antibiotics, but failed maximum medical treatment, persistent and worsening symptoms. If we look at the CT scan, you can see on the right hand side there's an impressive frontal sinus with a number of cells obstructing that frontal sinus. We do a walkthrough just looking at the coronal scan to get a general idea of what those cells look like. And then we come back and review our drainage pathway by looking at the axial scans to plan our scans. Uh, and understand uh, surgery on this particular patient. So let's do the building blocks. So when we do the building blocks, we can see we've got an agonizing cell, a superagal frontal cell, and then we've got a bullet modalis and superbullous cell, and a superbullous frontal cell as well. And these cells all combine to narrow down that frontal cell drainage pathway significantly. You can see that the superagal frontal cell and the superbullar frontal cell almost meet together to really obstruct their frontal ostium significantly and create that narrowing of that outlet of that frontal sinus. And we can identify the drainage pathway using the slider. We can then see how that pathway is initially anterior to the superbullar frontal and then gets pushed posteriorly by the superagar frontal and uh, is squashed between these two cells significantly. And that, that drainage pathway tends to be more lateral uh, than what you initially think due to a medial cell placed above the superbullar cell. So if we review the surgery, we can see the first step is to create nasal flap. Incisions are made and the flap is raised and tucked between the septum and the terminate. Hedger coughler punch removes the anterior face of the agonizing cell and exposes the agonizing cell. We can remove the roof of the agonizing cell and we start to view the entrance to the super agonizing cell. We have a super buddha cell present as well. So as we remove the roof of the agonizing cell, and expose the superbullar cell, we can start to visualize the superbullar frontal cell. So we know that the drainage pathway is more lateral and squashed between the superbullar frontal cell and the superangular frontal cell. So just taking away the roof of that superbullar cell starts to expose the superbullar frontal cell. We visualize the superbullar frontal cell quite clearly now going laterally. We can see anteriorly there is the superagar frontal cell, and now we just want to see the squashed drainage pathway between these two cells. Putting our instrument up, we start to gently fracture the air wall of the superagar frontal cell anteriorly, which will then start to widen our frontal drainage pathway. You can see that the frontal sinus is full of a thick impersated material um, clogging up the whole of the frontal sinus. So using our probe now, we gently fracture the 
wall of the super egg, a frontal cell anteriorly exposing the frontal posterior. Suction and washing out removes most of the debris within the frontal sinus, which is then sent for culture. Using our instrument now, we remove the rest of that anterior wall um, of the uh, superbullet frontal cell and the wall of the superagar frontal cell to completely expose the frontal osteum. I can see the skull base and the anterior artery is also clearly visible now. So by understanding the anatomy and doing a dissection preserving all the mucosa, we've now completed a very complete dissection of the frontal osteum and given, given a complete clearance of the frontal sinus. In summary, unlocking the frontal sinus is vitally important to fully understand the anatomy, to create that 3D image that requires you to have all the building blocks in place so that you know where the cells are, how they sit together, and how those cells relate to our frontal sinus drainage pathway. Identifying that pathway is critical to our surgical planning and to being able to predict each step of your surgical section so that your surgery is always completely controlled and completely understood uh, for the whole of the procedure, allowing you a complete dissection with reduced risk to your patient. The software is provided to us free of charge uh, by Stryker. If you go to the uh, address on the slide, uh, you should get a free subscription per year, which is renewable annually. And thank you to Schreiter for providing this educational service to us. Uh, thank you once again for listening to me, and I look forward to being able to contact you and meet up with you in the near future um, once COVID has passed. Thank you once again. Thank you. <clears throat> I hope everything uh, watched this uh, masterclass. PJ Wormann is uh, one of the real masters in frontal sinus. Uh, and uh, I think that all the steps he provided surgically and anatomically will allow you to perform a better frontal sinusotomy in a, in a safe manner. So this was the last um, topic for this year. Um, if anyone missed the previous talk, I remember you to go and check the Association as a Sana YouTube channel. Everything is available for free. And just an update for the future meeting for 2022, uh, January 11th, we are going to have a Marjolaine Cornet from, from the Netherlands, which uh, she's going to talk about monoclonal antibodies in chronic rhinosinusitis. What are the risks? Other January 25th, Rishi Mandavia, who is the um, president of the European Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery Junior. He's going to talk about the new Junior European Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery Committee, our plans so, moving forward. February 16th, the previous, the past president of the Academy, Hesham Saleh, who is going to talk about aesthetic orbital decompression. And uh, February 2012 is going to be Narayan Prepajaran from Malaysia, who is going to talk about patient preparation for endoscopic sinus surgery. A lot of activities for 2022, so I'll suggest you to keep updated. For more information, visit www.nazosana.it. I wish uh, Merry Christmas and, uh, and I hope every, everyone will be safe during this pandemic from me personally as a president and founder and from the whole Nazosano Association. Stay safe, 